say 30 minutes or so. I, I do want to... Uh, now, Brother Pierce asked the question about uh, the matter, like I said, use the matter, first string, second string, third string. Is that going to take place in heaven? Yes, it will. Um, however, the, the other part that needs to be brought out about this is your joy is going to be full. There's not going to be any kind of, you know, part where that you say that you are upset because you're third string or whatever. At the same time, the first stringers are not going to have a bunch of pride and look down. And I'll get into some of this here uh, in just a minute. Um, now, will secret words and deeds of believers and their sins uh, be exposed on the last day. I would, I, I do believe that that is the case. However, there were times whenever I was growing up, I thought, okay, it's going to be one person. Everybody's going to stand in front of the Lord and the Lord's going to judge that one person in front of everybody else. As I have read more and more as the years have gone by, I, I don't believe that that's the case. The, the judgment will be individual, and you will be, number one, you've got to look at the holiness of God. So absolute purity is going to be there. So if there's absolute purity, then sins that have been lived out, the Lord's not going to bring those because why don't we uh, read some scripture? Uh, first, first Corinthians four or five would appear. Uh, we've read that. Let's read that one more time. First Corinthians chapter four and verse five. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. And then shall every man have praise of God. Now, let's turn over a few pages and look in Colossians chapter 3 and look at uh, verse 25. Um, it talks about a commendation or praise uh, that comes from the Lord. And here's what takes place. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done and there is no respect of persons let me back up and read 24 knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done and there is no respect of persons I think the key word that you need to you really need to look at is in verse 24 where that it speaks of we're going to receive a reward for our inheritance. So what is the Lord going to do with those actions or activities that took place in the past? That's where you sum it up in that song there's power in the blood but let's read some scripture that looks to that. Turn back in the Old Testament to that hard to find book, Micah. And let's look at Micah chapter 7 and verse 19. Uh, these verses indicate that the Lord will never again call our sins to his remembrance. So if you have confessed and you have repented, and turned away from those things, the Lord's not going to bring that back up to your attention. So whatever's in the past, if there's been a conversion that has taken place and that person has been born again, those things are not going to come to light. Thank God. Micah chapter 7 verse 19, He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. 
Now, I know y'all hear me constantly. <laughs> I don't know whining or ranting about you reading your Bible. This scripture right here is one of the ones the devil wants to keep you ignorant of. He don't want you to know this. He wants you walking around in depression, condemnation, can't get your hands up, can't, can't pray with authority. I'm convinced of this. I'm convinced that one of the greatest needs in the apostolic church today is this right here. I really believe that. And some of it may be me getting older, but I have heard a lot of what I call razzmatazz preaching in the past. It, it, it sent us soaring, but it was very light biblically. And if you know your Bible, that's what the devil, if he can keep you ignorant then he, he's got half of his battle is fought. Yes, sir. Micah 7, 18 says, Who is a God like unto thee that perdoneth iniquity and passeth by transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. Amen. That is true. We, we serve a merciful God. God is very merciful. Okay, now you have to balance that out. Who's he merciful to? Those he's called to him. Now on the other hand, Scripture says he is angry with the wicked. When? Every day. If you want to know about the anger of God... I mentioned Sunday night when I was preaching. Go back and find John Haller's prophecy update from maybe a month ago or so. And he starts describing, and I, I knew about some of this, about, his, the, about the transgender surgeons and what they put those kids through. And then five years later, their suicide rates are through the roof. And yet they're making massive amounts of money on these surgeries. I'm telling you, God is angry with those people. They're wicked. They're drawing in and taking advantage of people who are deceived. And there's a lot of other. And yet, Brother Tester read it. I'll read it for the sake of the video. Micah 7, 18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. And so you start looking at this part. When, when you start drawing close to God and you start repenting and confessing and there's conversion that takes place. He puts all of that in the sea of forgetfulness. So remember those two scriptures, Micah chapter 7, verse 18. Back up a few pages and look at Psalm 103 and 12. Psalm 103 and 12. And this is another one that the devil wants to keep you ignorant of. He don't want you to know this. Psalm 103 and 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Now why didn't the Lord, why, don't, why didn't his word say from north to south? Because here's the deal. There's a North Pole and there's a South Pole. You got a stopping point. But when you look at east from west, it's ongoing. It just keeps on going. And that's what he says. He says that your sins, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Turn over a few pages and look in Isaiah 43.
Isaiah 43 and look at verse 25. says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. And I've got one other one that I want to read to you. Turn to Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12. These are scriptures that, again, if you're, if you're wanting to memorize some scriptures, maybe working toward next year, uh, these are some good ones to commit to memory. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And then turn over one page and look at chapter 10 and verse 17. In their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So again, let's go back to the question. Will all of the secret words and deeds of believers and their sins be revealed on the last day? No. No, they will not. Believers. That's the key word. Okay? Believers, converts, saints, those sorts of things, those things will not, they're, 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 they're under the blood. Under the blood. And, and again, now, I, you know, I, I've heard people before, in fact, I'm remembering a situation right now, and this would have been 25 or 30 years ago. I, I remember somebody right outside the doors out in the hallway. Uh, it was a Sunday morning. Most everybody had already cleared out. And I remember a young man basically yelling at Brother Patterson and, and telling him, it's under the blood. You, you're, you're trying to dredge up something. And Brother Patterson was not. But what this guy was doing was they were taking liberty with sin and were actively practicing a dark fleshly sin. And Brother Patterson confronted him. And he told Brother Patterson, it ain't none of your business. And that guy walked out. And to my sad deal right now, he's lost. And that's where you have to take into consideration what Paul said in Romans 6. Are we going to be involved in sin for the sake of the power of grace? He said, God, shall we continue in sin? God forbid. We, we're, we're dead to that. So, so keep in mind that if it, is, if it is habitual, ongoing, unrepentant sin... Now, here's what happens with people that do that. It gets harder and harder and harder and harder for them to repent. And, uh, boy, story's coming to mind right now. Um, I, I would, again, just, you know, I would caution people that wants to go out and get involved in things and then want to come back in here and have a blowout service and, you know, take a lap or two and feel better about they do not need to be doing that. Um, their flesh needs to be crucified. That, that's what needs to happen. So, um, anyways, well, let's, let's move on. Now, um, even though there are degrees of reward in heaven, the joy of each person is going to be full. And... That joy is going to last for eternity. Now, here's what true joy, and Brother Testa mentioned this to Brother Pierce and I just a few minutes ago. Well, what is true joy going to be like whenever you get to heaven? It's going to be delighting in the Lord. Your delight is not going to depend on what size house you live in, where your street address is, what you drive, what you wear, how much you have. 
down here, that's kind of got, you know, that's kind of the delight. But when you get to heaven, your delight's going to be totally in God and in his kingdom. And that's going to be pretty powerful in itself. And then rejoicing uh, in, in the, the status and position that he has given to every single one of us. And so rather than this matter of reward and putting us into a place where that we're competitive with each other, I'll tell you what it should do. It should, it should motivate and encourage us to try to encourage others. Turn over, well, you're right there. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 and look at verse 24. Here's what the Bible says. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Encourage people. Do what you can do to help them in their, in their spiritual growth. Now again, it's like I mentioned a little earlier, you don't want to throw off the part where that you're not being, you know, soft preaching creates hard souls. Hard preaching makes soft souls. So you want that balance there. But you don't need to spend all your time in the, oh boy, I don't want to be convicted. Oh boy, I don't want to be. Y'all know what it's like to be have refreshing repentance that takes place in your life. At the same time, you also know what it's like <laughs> to feel like you've got a water pistol and you're like hunting devils. Okay? All of us probably have, have experienced those things. So what, what's the real, you, there's the balance between the two. And I, I, I believe the Lord ministers to us in that way. So the, the future of, re, of eternal reward, I believe, should motivate us, every one of us. It, it really, it really should. Now, let's move on real quick. And the next one uh, is that the angels and demons will be judged, and uh, we'll move through this one pretty quickly. Turn to Revelation chapter twenty and look in verses one. Uh, here's what the Bible says: And I saw an angel. This is a, this is another one to memorize or remember where it's at. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now, let me point out something in verse 2. See where he says he laid hold on the dragon? And then he says that old serpent. Notice what's taking place. Where is the serpent at? Genesis 3. It's a serpent. It's a snake. But as time has gone on, the snake has turned into a roaring dragon. That's where when Paul says evil men will wax worse and worse. So the cumulative effect of evil is going to, as we get closer to the rapture, it's going to get even worse. Why is that? It's because he's gone from a serpent and he will be a, he will be a, a dragon. So, so just keep, keep that. Church is the safest place you can be. Okay? And so the devil will be seized and bound, thrown into a pit. It's going to be bound for a thousand years. That's going to be, and it'll be loose for a season. But the final judgment uh, has an outcome. I'll just give you the, well, you've got the verse references, Matthew 25, 41, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, and then Jude chapter 6. And then ultimately he's going to be cast into a lake of fire. And once he's in the lake of fire, then he is forever banished. And that'll be a that that'll be certainly to to our relief. Okay? Now, again, what we're doing is we're working through. You remember we started off and we said there's going to be several future judgments that's going to take place. So we've talked about the judgment of the judgment seat of Christ, which is for believers. 
And we've talked about the judgment of angels and demons and Satan. The next one that we look at is the matter is that Israel is going to be judged. And so when you start looking at this, the Lord is going to set up an earthly kingdom. So what does that earthly kingdom look like? Now some of this is kind of an overlap of Wednesday night Bible study that I have been teaching. But look in Zechariah uh, chapter 14 and look there in verse 4. The Bible says there, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Look to verse 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, in that day shall there, shall there be one Lord and his name one. Now if you want to write in the margin of your Bible for verse uh, 9, a cross reference is Revelation 22 verses 3 and 4. And I just wrote that out in the side of my margin there um, beside verse 9. Revelation 22 verses 3 and 4. Now, what's going to take place? There's got to be judgment to determine who's going to enter in into that. And I'm not going to read all of these verses, but in Ezekiel chapter 20 and verses 33 through 38 explains this event where that Israel is going to be judged. Now let me point out some things in verse 33. The Lord is going to be king over Israel at that time. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 33. In verse 34, Ezekiel says he's going to gather them in. And then in verses 35 and 36, it says that, that there will be um, a, a face-to-face -face gathering. It's going to be very similar to what the Lord did with Israel after the Exodus comes out. There, there was a face-to-face -face appearance where that God is going to be face-to-face -face with Israel. So what's going to take place? Well, in verse 37, Israel, they're going to have to pass under the shepherd's rod to enter back into a covenant. So the Lord's going to, and y'all know Psalm 23, thy rod and thy staff, it comfort me. Okay, well, the rod was a measure of, of judgment or entrance. So he's going to hold that rod out. Those sheep are going to come in. Now what's going to take place is the Bible tells us that there's going to be a part where that there's going to be some rebels and the Lord's not going to let them in. And that's where that we're going to take place in the judgment of Israel. And uh, I'm rushing through. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm trying to get this. Uh, I know, Brother Testa, I know what everybody's... Is, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Brother, brother Pierce is lobbying for everybody's got to work tomorrow. He said, "Brother Tester's retired." And <laughs> so, anyways, um, but um, now Paul makes reference in Romans eleven and verses twenty six and twenty seven. Here is what he talks about: that Israel is going to be saved. So when you look at that matter, now, if you cross-reference Isaiah 59, verses 20 and 21, and then Jeremiah 31 and 31 through 34, the cross-references helps us to see something in this matter called the New Covenant. Now, the New Covenant, and again, when you interpret prophecy, what you do is you go all the way back to Genesis 12, where the, the Lord established a covenant with Abraham. And when the Lord established a covenant with Abraham, there's a variety of areas. There was a land covenant or the Palestinian covenant. 
That's where that you start looking at from the Euphrates, I think, to the Tigris, all of that area. The Palestinian or the land covenant. The Lord said, this is going to be your land. Now, think about that right now. That when you look at Israel, that little small sliver that's just to the west of the Jordan, and that whole world around there is totally filled up now with Muslim nations that are around. And yet God's promise to Abraham through Isaac, not Ishmael, but to Isaac, then to Jacob, then to the patriarchs, Joseph being part of that. So it did not come, it's not going to Ishmael. The promise is to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then the patriarchs. All of that land. You're like, you look at that right now and you're like, you got to be kidding me. But God's word is true. And so there will come a day when they will have that whole area that will be around that. Luke chapter 22 and verse 20, the new covenant started with the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the new covenant establishes an earthly kingdom, but not all of Israel is going to come into that. And so Ezekiel 30, 20 and 38, the Lord is going to purge out the rebels. Who are the rebels? The rebels are the wicked. Those that were not born again, they will not enter into that kingdom. And so then you get into the part where you get in, it's like, okay, where the Matthew 25, five wise, five foolish, separation that takes place. Then you get into the part where that you're talking about the, the uh, parable of the, the talents. And you start looking at that and you say, well, I thought that that was the church. Well, you can apply them to the church, but keep in mind that the Olivet Discourse starts in Matthew 24. That deals with God's plan and purpose for Israel. So Matthew 25, now you can preach or teach that part that has to do with the rapture, but I believe the rapture and the second advent are two different events. And yet when you get to Matthew 25, there's going to be five wise and going to be five foolish. And I can remember as a kid, and I've even preached it before. I've got a sermon called Midnight Oil Crisis. And I preached that years ago, right here, this pulpit to this church, in this building. And uh, it's a long time ago. Uh, and I preach it the way that, that saints of God can let their oil run low. So, so, so the, the part is applicable to the church, but at the end of the day, the ultimate context of that is God's dealing with Israel. So what is he doing? He's separating out. And there will be some that will be saved. There will be some that will turn aside and they will be lost. So that's the part of the new covenant. Now quickly... This is the last one. And this is the white throne judgment. This is where you do not want to be. Now, I've got that laid out there for you. The timing uh, is, in, is, is in Revelation chapter 20. The timing, when is it going to take place? That's going to be after the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ. Who is the judge? Well, Revelation chapter 4, verses 2 through 11, tells us that God, which is Jesus Christ, is going to be the judge. There's one that sits on the throne. Okay? There is one that's there. And you can trace that all the way through. And so the judge, again, is the Lord Jesus Christ. What's the purpose? Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15 is to determine who goes to the lake of fire, which is referred to as the second death. That's in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6. So the white throne is a place where the unbelievers end up and they land there. So who are the subjects? Revelation chapter 20 and verse 13 is unbelievers who have been raised from death and hell. They've been raised up out of the grave. 
So that means Adolf Hitler, Stalin, um, Saddam Hussein, Lenin, Paul Pot, Mao Zedong, all those guys. Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Domitian, Diocletian, all those guys. They're coming forward. In addition to those guys down there at Cowboys, just the good old rednecks. And that's really sad. It's sad that you've got people that are just good old boys. But good old boys aren't going to make it to heaven. Good old girls aren't going to make it to heaven. They've got to have had a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and have been converted. And the, the, the concern is that you like, you know, I, and I, I mean, y'all, you know people in the same, just like I do. And they were just good old folks. They just, you know, they, and yet they're going to be in this, they're going to be in that place with the great men, the evil, the wicked and that's where they're going to be. Now, what's the basis of it? Their works. Verse 13, uh, the evidence for this is the content of the books. The Bible says that the books were open. That includes the records uh, that are there before the throne, the character and the deeds that are there. And the Bible says that there was another book, which is described as the book of life, that's the ones that uh, list the names of those that have been saved by the Lord. And then there is another book that's going to be a testimony against the unsaved whose names are not written in that book. And you've heard preachers, you may have even used this before in your, you know, some of your witnessing, teaching, whatever. You start, oh, let's see, where are we going to find his name? Is his name... Oh, I don't see your name there. It's literally going to be like that. And when you look at Revelation 20, you've got to make sure that your name is there. And again, don't put it off. Don't wait. Don't. We've got to get in the church. We've got to get neck deep in the church. And, uh, you know, in that day, excuses are going to be so weak whenever you start looking at the magnitude and the power that God has done for us. Okay, now real quick. Um, so let's say why are the reasons for a final judgment? So that justice is served in the world. Now why, why does justice need to be served in the world? Because there's a very clear distinction between good and evil. And if God does not judge evil... Then that, is not, then that means that God is not good. But God is good. And so because God is good, but even more so because God is holy, there's going to be justice that's going to be established and served there. I would say the other thing too is, is that we would have to say this matter for a reason, for a final judgment, is because, because we've been forgiven, we need to forgive others. And sometimes that can be challenging. Amen. Okay, it really can. The devil can get in your mind. Your flesh can get in the way. He's like, oh yeah, I got a right. I got a right for faith. Not a right, you know that song, oh, I've got a right to praise the Lord. It's like sometimes I got a right to be offended. I got a right to be mad. But when you realize the matter of the final judgment, then at some point you, you got you to gotta let that go. You got to say, I'm done with this. I got to move on. Um, it brings a reason for moral living. What does that mean? Knowing that if you don't live right, there's a penalty that's going to come. And just think about this. What act of sin is worth you spending an eternity that you're lost, that I'm lost? So the final judgment brings us a reason for moral living. And then lastly, it should motivate us toward evangelism. To try to reach and touch as many people as we possibly can. And just say, you know what? What we're doing here is serious. So, anyways. Okay. Well, it's 8, it's 8.30, 8.32. And we've managed to spend another Tuesday night here at the church. Thank you all for coming. And uh, Lord bless you. 
and we'll have, we'll see y'all tomorrow night.